87% of women have had it's when they didn't want to, whether to get out of a situation or because they're too embarrassed to say no. It's always right to say no. Absolutely always. Consent needs to be affirmative, needs to be honest, needs to be sober and needs to be ongoing. Sorry, I'm going to stop you. That's massive. Say that again. If you're mm. drunk, you cannot give consent. Legally. Yes, exactly. Even consent legally, doesn't yes. apply. Most men are good men and they would take that as a, as a no. Yes. But we have to be empowered as women. Yeah. We have to share that. that it's mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. yeah. to say no. Welcome to the She Word, conversations that women rarely have but really should. So before we get going, first of all, welcome, but also you see that subscribe button somewhere down here. And if you're listening to us on Spotify, go and have a look at the screen. There's a there's subscribe, there's a like, there's a follow, whatever it is. Guys, just make sure you hit it because we have so much stuff happening here on the She Word. You don't want to miss a thing. So make sure you subscribe, make sure you follow us, make sure you join us on all of our channels and you can be up to date with everything that's happening, particularly over the next six months because it's about to get very, very exciting. Now, to our viewers that are joining us here on the Patreon page, a very special welcome to you. I know you've been amazingly patient. We have amazing deals from our program partners. All you have to do is scroll back up through the page. You'll see there's some fantastic offers from our partners. And also, we will be having exclusive content coming to you very, very soon. But of course, you are actually seeing this show before anybody else. So welcome to you, but a very special Thank you, because you as a Patreon page subscriber means that everything that you give to us, we give 50% of that straight to the Richmond Foundation to support women who are seeking therapy and support and cannot afford it. So you are superheroes. Thank you very much. Now, on the she word, health is a very important topic. In fact, it's one of the most frequently discussed topics here on the show, mental health, mental health on the young women's edition. Also, we've had menopause twice. We've talked about menstruation. We've talked about postpartum and pregnancy. We had a show dedicated to women's health in general. But this show was the suggestion of one of today's guests. And when I said to Fran Fenaconti, what do you want to discuss on the she word? She said, we want to discuss women and sexual health. And it was one of those light bulb moments when I said, darn it, yes, we need to be doing that. So it's not only an important conversation that's rarely had, but it's also a, a conversation that has alarming statistics associated with it. And we're going to come to that in just a second. But first of all, I'm going to introduce today's guests. Fran Fenaconti, I just mentioned you. You are the founder of Women for Women. You are also a, an advocate for empowerment for women. And it's brilliant to have you here. And thank you for suggesting this topic. <laughs> I suggested it, not because I'm an expert in the topic. I'm maybe an expert through experience because I have many years. <laughs> Whoa! Fran opens her welcome by saying she has but, a lot of sex. We're coming to that in just a second. <laughs> Nicola Falzan, it's so cool to have you here. We've been talking as a group for quite a number of weeks. You are the head of, pre of prevention at YMCA Malta, so already you are practically a superhero within the midst of this table. You're a trainee psychotherapist and you are a mental and sexual health advocate. So thank you for being here. I'm going to get you to fill in the gaps in just a second. And Donia Grimaldi. Hello. Hello. I love your dress, by the way. You look absolutely gorgeous. Thank you you are a doctor specializing in sexually transmitted infections, contraception and psychosexual medicine. That's right. I'm going to stick with you because when I said how I was going to introduce you, you said, well, there's some other bits and pieces. So can Don, can you just fill in the gaps? What else is there to you? 
So yes, um, I am a consultant in sexual health, HIV, and sexual health is quite a broad term. Obviously, that's why we're here today discussing this vast topic. But sexual health also incorporates in it not just diagnosing, managing, and treating sexually transmitted infections, but also encompasses HIV care. So we do HIV prevention and treatment. So I also care for people living with HIV. And then uh, the broader term is now also encompassing integrated sexual health services so that's also family planning contraception and psychosexual medicine which means you look um, beyond the medical physical aspect of of certain uh, diseases that might affect the genitals but looking also at the psychological aspects of people maybe presenting with erectile dysfunction and other uh, female I, mean, I think today we'll be focusing on women so other other conditions affecting women like vaginismus uh, that uh, there might be a psychological component beneath beneath the, their presentation. I am so glad that you're here. But can I ask you a question before I let the ladies introduce themselves? Uh, also, just a question: Why did you all did you always know that you wanted to go into sexual health? No, I would be lying if I say I always wanted to do that. But I liked gynecology. I liked urology, um, but I don't like doing surgery. So this is medical gynecology, medical urology. So I get to see both men and women. I think just focusing on only on women, if I had to do gynecology, I probably wouldn't like it. So I balance that with some testosterone from the men. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. That's like the best way of explaining that. That's it's, fantastic. It's a very rewarding, um, it's a very rewarding uh career uh, special specialization not very known by a lot of people so when i tell them i'm a geo specialist like what is that is that a gynecologist is that a urologist um so it's not very much um kind of known especially locally um but also most of our infections are now are treatable are curable so it gives me a lot of satisfaction someone comes in really unwell but then you treat them because it's usually very well treated with antibiotics and then off they go home much better so you see, yeah. you're a superhero as well. We've got some fantastic <laughs> women at the table. I'm so glad that you're here. I'm going to come to you, Nicola. Did I miss anything? I mean, you, you are also a superhero on this table. Tell me. So nice. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really happy to be here with all of you. Well, yeah, essentially, you summed it up well. I've been studying and working in the field of psychology, mental health, and sexual health for the past 10 years. Um, as you mentioned, I'm currently in my final year to become a psychotherapist, and my practice is heavily informed by psychosexual therapy and psychosexual education. It's what I'm most passionate about. So aside from training to work on mental health conditions, I'm focusing also on helping individuals and couples with sexual issues, um, questions about relationships. I mean, there's so much to talk about. So I'm happy, very happy that we're talking about this topic today. Well, I think you probably agree that this is really is one of those conversations that are rarely had. Yeah. But really are important. Yeah. Especially the relationship between mental health and sexual health and how one can impact the other. So. Well, we have to thank Fran for coming up with this idea because I literally said to Fran, I want to have you on the show. What do you want to talk about? And you said sexual health. So fill in the gaps. I mean, you're very familiar face. Lots and lots of people know you, but fill in the gaps, Fran. Okay. I mean, I don't think that many people know me, but I'm the founder of the Women Only Faces Group. And I'm, I have a lot, I'm not an expert in sexual health at all, but it's a topic that comes up very often. In fact, I tag, I tag Donia yeah, very often and I say, like, can you help? Can you answer the questions? So I think we need to talk about it more. Um, there's a lot of shame with STIs. Um, this is um, something that wh that's why I wanted to talk about it because lately um, I had no idea, for example, because I'm not an expert, genital herpes. This was one of the the um, the topics that came up recently on the group and the shame that the woman felt. She said this was one my only encounter. You know, she spoke to me and the, she was, you know, really. And the medication is really expensive. So, um, in fact, I offered to bring it for her from the, from Italy because it was so expensive anyway. So I think we really need to talk about uh, how you can just have one sexual encounter and get an STI. You know, um, it's not doesn't mean you're promiscuous or anything like that. Or there's no shame, even if you are. But, you know, it's we need to talk about. I couldn't agree mm. more. And I tell you why, when you said about this, Fran, I jumped on it because my personal story is that. Uh, my parting gift 
from my ex-husband was an STD or an STI that I knew nothing about. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know about it until it had made me infertile. Yes. And so whilst we think, you know, it's an STI, it's an STD, whatever you want Mm -hmm. to refer them as, you know, it's not really a big deal. It is a big deal because if you don't know about it or if you have no idea because some of these like pelvic inflammatory disease has Mm -hmm. you could live with for years with no symptoms, Mm -hmm. which is exactly what happened Mm -hmm. to me. And when I went to the the uh, the gynecologist, he said, I'm really sorry, you're never going to have children. And that's devastating. So this topic is so important. And I want to just start off by listing some statistics, some statistics that just, just came out. In 2021, Malta was found to have the highest rate of HIV diagnoses in Europe with the rate of 15.9 per 100,000 population, which may not sound like a lot, but significantly higher than the EU uh, average of 3.7. 15.9 versus 3.7. I mean, this is insane. Also, of another uh, survey that came out with the Times recently, uh, the statistics that came out from that, people who live in the northern part of Malta watch the most pornography. People who live in the Southern Harbour area have the most sex, uh, most frequently eight times a month. However, the Malta average is six times a month. 53% of respondents said that they have or watch pornography and roughly just as many said they occasionally masturbate alone. And of those who watch pornography and have a partner, the significant 74% said it was their partner who is aware that they watch porn. Now, all of this is part of the changing world that we live in. And things have changed from, let's say, when I was first having my first partner and my first sexual encounter. And We have to address this now in 2023 because things have changed a lot. And we're going to talk about HIV and we're going to talk about STDs as well because we're going to be approaching sexual health from a wide range of angles. But before we do that, I want to refer back to the show that I know you ladies have watched, Women and Intimacy. And Antonella Bajaya made a really good point. She said if we only count sex as penetration, then gay women have never had sex. So before we go into everything that goes with it, how do we define sex and how do we find define good sexual health? I'm going to start with Fran over there because apparently she has a lot of it. <laughs> <laughs> Your words, not mine. No, no, no. What I meant is I'm the eldest around this table, so throughout my life yeah, I've had yeah, yeah. <laughs> probably had more <laughs> that's not what we heard right <laughs> um how do we what do I I think for me sex is um the intimacy of it's not only <clears throat> penetration definitely not it's the touching feeling of, of genitals of each other's genitals sharing that intimate moment you don't have to have penetration um and being comfortable with the person fun having fun we don't you know we mustn't forget that sex is meant to be fun if you're not having fun just don't do it you know and it has to be consensual always um so for so for me um that's my dis- definition of sex um uh, but go back to your question is that did i answer your question you did you i said how do we define sex mm-hmm. and how do we define good sexual okay. health okay good sexual health so basically um from a psycho some psych- psychological for me aspect is being really in tune with the person that you're having sex with from a health perspective i think being safe having safe sex um obviously maybe knowing your partner before how many partners they've had before especially if it's the first time you know you have to be careful you can just have one sexual encounter that can ruin your life unfortunately okay yeah. So the you experts guys. can tell, say yeah. more about the health aspect. Yes, I am in agreement with mm-hmm. Fran, what just Fran uh, mentioned now. So we tend to think of sex as penetrative sex. And this I see it in the clinic every 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 time. So obviously when my patients come to my clinic, I have to take a sexual history. So I always start, you know, I have to ask you some questions. They might sound a bit strange to you. The reason I'm asking you these questions is not because I'm inquisitive, because I want to know, you know, the details of your life. But obviously they're important for 
me to guide me on what test you need and uh, what treatment you would need. And I always ask, when was the last sex? And sometimes they tell me like a month ago. Then I go on and say even oral sex, but they tell me, no, that doesn't count. No. And so there is a very common misconception that sex equals penetrative sex. So as Antonella mentioned in in in, in her in in her in the podcast when she was here, that a, a common misconception is that oral sex, anal sex, does not count. But it is obviously not the case. And we know that some infections, not some, a lot of infections like chlamydia, gonorrhea, you know, syphilis, uh, can transmit through oral sex. And I still remember one of my very first patients in in my practice and uh, she was uh, like a 32 year old lady but she was very much phobic of sexually transmitted infections in fact she was seeing a therapist to address her anxiety around this and then after many years of of help and support she managed to meet someone and she had oral sex only Okay, and she got HPV. I still remember her very clearly in the clinic. She was devastated. HPV HPV is? is human papillomavirus. It's a very common virus. It is transmitted through through skin to skin contact. So some infections they don't they don't even need oral sex to transmit. So skin to skin contact can transmit certain infections. So I still remember her words very clearly. So she told me, "I'm still a virgin and I have an STI." Wow. So. Wow. Okay, so this is a really cool way to start. We're talking about defining sex psychologically and also yeah. physically as well. Yeah. So coming back to that's defining sex, but just in a very brief sentence, how do you define good sexual health? So yes, good sexual health, I mean, what WHO or the World Health Organization says that um, to have good sexual health needs to be uh, free of coercion, free of, of violence, it needs to be fully consensual, okay? And it's not just the absence of disease or infirmity, because sometimes, obviously, me as a doctor, <coughs> I put my geo-doctor hat on. If there are no infections, it's good sexual health. But sometimes I take a step back and I say, it's not just the absence of disease, of disorder, of or infirmity was it enjoyable was it pleasurable because sometimes we forget or at, at least me as a doctor i focus on the health disease section but i forget that you know good sexual health always also means pleasurable sex obviously wanted sex you know and the broader term of intimacy and connection with the other person that you're having that. sex with mm. <laughs> and nicola is nodding yes. like yes. crazy <laughs> add to that my darling I mean, I was slow clapping throughout that entire episode. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I've learned recently, and I'm really fascinated by this term, is that in, in our field of psychosexual therapy, we're starting to refer to something as core play. So when we're thinking about um, foreplay, which is what we commonly refer to the stages before penetrative sex, this is generally then what people that aren't having penetrative sex would be having. And as we've been saying, a lot of people don't consider that sex which is what Antonella mentioned, right? So we're shifting towards talking about it as core play because first of all, regardless of your sexual orientation, what kind of sex you're having, for the majority of women, this is the most enjoyable part. For the majority of people, this is the most enjoyable part. And for a lot of people, this is more than enough. So this is core play. It's not foreplay. play. So it's, I like yes, that. can I ask, because obviously you're the expert, so... Core play would, would be the same as foreplay, but you were just renaming it. It could be anything, yeah. really. I mean, one of the things I'm really the happy whole to thing, see. Eh? The yes. whole thing, yeah, the without any penetrative sex. And all sex, the body. Exactly. So one of the things I'm, I'm really happy to start, to, that we are seeing mm. on TV shows is that people with disabilities can have sex. People of all genders have sex. There's a lot of different ways people, people can achieve pleasure avoiding the genitals altogether. In the body, we have around 10 erogenous zones. There's a lot of different areas that are pleasurable in the body. Doesn't this count as sex? Isn't this enough for it to be intimacy? Maybe somebody that it's can't a, have penis in vagina or whatever in vagina, toy in vagina. That's not only sex that exists, right? Wasn't that great of Antonella? Kudos to Antonella to open that up and to start That's changing true. that conversation, the structure of the conversation around sex. Yeah. Thank you, ladies. So we've gone through that, and I think that we're going to unpack that over the course of this podcast because we're going to be looking at the emotional, medical, and physical sexual health. And already in the first five minutes, we've touched on each of those. So I want to ask a question 
relating to a conversation I just had just literally a couple of days ago. I was sitting around this table talking to to some of the podcasters, some of the she worders, and we were talking about losing virginity and sex as it was defined when you were growing up. And now, of course, if penetrative sex was what we all regard as your first sexual encounter, having sex, a lot of us who came from religious or reserved or conservative backgrounds would go all the way except penetrative sex and say, well, I'm still a virgin. But bearing in mind what we've just said here, that's not the case at all. And actually it's kind of a gray area, not clearly defined. So then that led on to the question of where do, where do women, where do young women as well learn about sex? Where does that knowledge come from? Where does the information and opinions about sex come from? Because I think we've defined in the first few minutes that actually quite a lot of us have been getting wrong for a long time. So where are most women finding out, where, where are they getting this information from? I mean, I, I think... At my age, we got it from nowhere, from our first encounters. Nobody told us anything. Nowadays, I think, thankfully, they're getting it from school, but I think there's a lot of porn, which leads to misconceptions about sex. Um, I'm not an expert, but I know that at school, the the sexual health program has, um, and the sex education has changed a lot from my time. Um, But again, it, it depends on who's delivering it, apparently. So if you have a teacher, but I could be wrong, so... Um, if you have a teacher that is maybe a bit conservative, maybe religious, she might not um, be as open as another teacher who is more open-minded, um, would explain better how to use condoms. Um, but so, but this is what I've been told. I can't vouch you, for... You said about school, and I'm just going to jump mm. in there and set for a second, because my sex education was one hour Nothing. at right. school when I was 11 years old, and my mum gave me a book to fill in the gaps. And the back, the book was really very yeah. clinical. And that, bearing in mind that this is something that we should be doing, you know, on average eight, to, mm. if you live in the south and six in the north, <laughs> times a month, it's a part of our lifestyle. It is, a, it is absolutely part of our lifestyle. And that's one hour that I had when I was at school. I had nothing. It's and my, I was, I'm older than you, Malta. You were probably, much. but <laughs> you were in the UK. So <laughs> probably that, a bit yeah. op- more open-minded. I mean, my mother never spoke to me about sex. At the time, even if you said the word pregnant, it was almost mm-hmm. something of a taboo, you know, so. But opinions must have come from somewhere. I think also, his, I mean, if you look at the educational aspect, because of focusing on reproduction and pregnancy and abstinence and all of that, that's likely where the idea that sex is penis and vagina Mm -hmm. came from, right? Mm -hmm. And that's why it eliminated other sexual orientations and other forms of sex. And I'm I'm sure that sex education has improved a lot Mm -hmm. in schools and there's private institutions doing it and all of this and talks and, but I think what's really important and this is going back to cultural, et cetera, is Mm -hmm. that, I think a mistake we've done with a lot of topics is that we've treated them in isolation. So I can come and talk to you for one hour about sex, but have we talked about relationships? Have we talked about dating? Have we talked about having a crush? Have we talked about friendships? Have we talked about boundaries? There's so many steps before. So if I'm just coming to you and telling you, this is what sex is, am I aware of the steps before? And am I actually assimilating this information and understanding that this isn't just books, facts, and life can be very different. So there's a lot of contextual things to think about, but I think this is where I'm thinking of the medical model. That's where this idea came from of what virginity is. And it's all about the reproductive <coughs> focus. Sorry, focus. And, and just saying on that, you know, that's when you're talking about that sort of clinical, that pregnancy, blah, blah, that's taking out all of the pleasure, which you just mentioned. Yeah. And also Antonella said something <coughs> great on the, I mean, good grief that made young woman is amazing but she also talked about the fact that every woman's vulva and vagina is different thank you so much to both of you for sharing (laughs) pictures on the whatsapp group before we did this show which came in at seven o'clock in the morning and i can tell you that was quite surprising but it's true you know you have to know your own vulva and vagina and this is not something we have been talking about it's not something that's easily discussed and the pleasure part of it Mm -hmm. If, like us, we had very little sex education, you're kind of left to your own devices, yes. which is a disaster. Yeah. 
And there is a common misconception that if you speak to about to youths about a topic, kind of they get experimental and they're going to try it. And obviously, this has been proved wrong mm-hmm. ma- on many issues, contraception, you know, pregnancy. Okay. So there is still this misconception that if you're going to speak to 12, 13 year old teenagers about sex, they're going to get all excited, all experimental. Okay, off I'm going to go and try sex because this sounds exciting. And obviously, we know that that is wrong. Okay, for example, Netherlands they have this very good sex education. Yes, from they start like four at an extremely old, young old. age. Uh, okay, it would be unheard of to do <laughs> that in Malta. But look at their STI rates, they are one of the lowest in Europe. Here we are not talking about sex in Malta, we have one of the highest rates of, of STIs and even mm-hmm. HIV. I'm not saying that this is all the result of poor sex education, but, but I am it, pretty sure that it, it is a I'm contributing sure. factor. Mm-hmm. Okay, so we've established quite a lot of things. I'm still my <laughs> mind is blown in the first five five minutes of this conversation. Um, now we're going to stay stay with the the STIs STDs uh, that you just mentioned because I think this is one thing that I you are very passionate about addressing. And as I said, from my point of view, it had a huge impact on my life. And that, I have to say, was from lack of knowledge. Mm -hmm. Because I think, as we say, if you can't feel it, you don't even imagine that it's there. So according to WHO, uh, there is an estimation that there are possibly 13,000 new cases of STIs per year in Malta. These are the statistics. The GU Clinic issues an annual report which indicates an increasing number of service users over the years since its conception in in 2000. And as we've said before, which I think is is even more devastating, the the, the survey that looked at the HIV rate here in Malta, I mean, we're not just talking a, a small percentage above the EU average. We're talking three plus times the average uh, times the average in the EU. So I, I have a whole bunch of questions. I think, and I'd love to throw this out to the table. First of all, what is an STI or an STD and how do you know if you've got one? Good question. So we're now referring more to them as sexually transmitted infections or STIs in short rather than disease because most of them don't leave like a long-term um, permanent effect. So we're, we're speaking more of them as being infections rather than diseases. Um, so sexually transmitted infections, there are many. So there are more than 100 different um, viruses, bacteria, um, and what we call... Sorry, sorry, sorry. More than 100? Yes, that can be or sexually transmitted. So. Did you guys know this? Well, I mean, obviously. <laughs> I, I, I got to know recently. I mean, since I started on the group and we've started talking and I had the pleasure of meeting Donia and she's been very kind and, and explained certain things. So that's how I... I got to know but I mean it's a recent thing it's not something I knew we, we hear of a lot of common ones yes. but there is different bacteria yes. and tr- exactly. yeah, strains so the common ones as Nicolas mentioned um, would be like chlamydia, gonorrhea, mm. HIV syphilis, hepatitis those are like the big ones the most common ones and the ones that we've heard about but there are others which are rarer um, viruses and bacteria that can all be transmitted through sex. So in that, you know, for that reason, they are considered as sexually transmitted infections. Now, um, there are various symptoms that um, STIs can cause, um, but the most common symptom is no symptom. So a lot of people come to the clinic, they tell me, but how, how did you diagnose me with an STI? Are you sure you're not making a mistake? I have no symptoms. Like, what is the common symptom of chlamydia? And I tell them, you have the most common symptom that is no symptom that is in more than 70 percent of 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 patients carrying an um, an sti in fact have no symptoms if you'll be experiencing symptoms uh, in women the most common ones would be changes in the in the smell or consistency or color of the vaginal discharge there can be pain when having sex or bleeding after sex or irregular bleeding between one period and another in men, there can be burning when passing urine or uh, like discharge, so liquid coming from the water pipe from, you know, when not passing urine. There can also be pain in the, in, in the testicles. 
And in, in women, as you've mentioned in the introduction, if there is a complication then of the STI, like pelvic inflammatory disease, there can be pain in the there can be pain in the in the pelvic area, which might then lead to infertility. But in my experience, I was also going through endometriosis, so the pain, pain any pain that I had with with pelvic inflammatory disease was masked. Yeah. By the by having this, yeah. and of course, I was going to ask you, you know, what's the worst that can happen? Well, I can tell you what the worst that can happen is, mm -hmm. and you don't expect it because this is all happening without your knowledge, without you knowing what's going on. So, what I mean, <laughs> what is a? It sounds like a really obvious question, but what is? then safe sex to prevent. Exactly. That's what I was going to ask her, in fact, because mm. how safe, you know? Yeah. And, and also, because um, I'm not the expert, I'm going to ask some questions if you don't mind. <laughs> Sorry. You can take this. That's it. That's it. Fran's taking over the show. That's, That's never very... happened before. How do, how do, um, because the, the clinic, the Jew clinic mm -hmm. is inundated. So yes. you, unless you can, you go private, you can never go and test yourself just to see your situation, mm -hmm. if you actually might have mm -hmm. an STI, right? Correct me if I'm wrong. So, yes, I mean, we, there is one at it's the like, moment. like, you know, like um, if it's no symptoms, like in Trudy's case. Yes. Unless, so, so we recommend... And you don't have money yeah. to go and, you know, yeah. but you might, you think, Mike, I might, you know, maybe and that was risky. That's you know? part of the education, right? To, to, and I think that's what Donia was going to get to, that mm -hmm. ideally we, we start to make it part of our lifestyle. Like we go yes, to the gynae, yes, like we go exactly, to the dentist, exactly. that if I'm regularly sexually active mm -hmm. and with different yes. people. Mm -hmm. that can, I, can I caveat that yeah. by saying, actually, it's, I don't think it necessarily is if it's with lots of other people. If you it's have fun, exactly. any reason, definitely, mm -hmm. no matter how small, mm -hmm. You know, again, I'm going to share a story. My very best friend and I fell out because I'd been told that her fiancé was cheating on her. We fell out. She didn't want to hear that news. She, we, she didn't speak to me for eight years. She came back to me and said to me, you were right. Mm -hmm. I went, I had symptoms. I went to the, to the doctor and I found, yes. discovered I had an STD. Yes. Definitely, it can, it can be one. Yes, a lot of and she had only had sex with yeah. her husband. Yeah. Yeah. So yes. I think if there's any, any mm -hmm. doubt, so. Yeah, any doubt whatsoever. But I think the recommendation is that if you're having sex with one person and you've been tested, then kind of, the, I mean, Donia will clarify, but the frequency of how often you should go probably it's depends on if you're with yeah. one regular partner, yeah. etc. cetera. But you're sure that your partner is regular, yeah, the you only one with you, the only what you're doing. doing. Exactly. exactly. You never know. Because you never you know. Never know. That, that's unfortunately... Yeah. The truth. So coming back to you, because we, we're going to talk about the sort of psychological and everything else. But so I still want to come back to what is safe sex practice? Is it condom full stop? Because you also mentioned about uh, STIs that can be transmitted through oral sex. And you wouldn't necessarily, well, you're not going to put a condom on someone you're giving a oral sex. blowjob to. <laughs> yeah. are you? No, I know. Exactly. So, yeah, this is a very common question that I'm asked, especially after maybe someone is diagnosed with an STI or want to start, you know, with a very good sexual health. And they tell me, so, uh, like, how can I practice safe sex? And my answer, although I sound very negative, but it's, I'm being, you know, realistic, I say safe sex does not exist. Mm. Yeah, <clears throat> we can true. only speak of safer sex. Mm -hmm. How can we be safer? But safe sex does not 100 exist. Hundred percent safe. Like hundred percent safe. Like, you can you can never be, because some some viruses and these are very common viruses like the herpes virus and the human papilloma virus, the HPV that I've mentioned in the beginning, um, they are all transmitted by skin to skin contact. So if you're wearing a condom for all your sex, skin to skin touching is still going to happen. So some viruses can still transmit. So to be to be uh, kind of realistic, safe sex doesn't exist. But we can obviously be safer. So we can be safer by yes, our the good old condoms. Obviously, uh, I always mention those. I do sound a bit old-fashioned when I mention them, you know. And the youngsters are like, 
condoms like but surely there must be something else but obviously there are male and female condoms um, that will help um, reduce significantly the risk of transmission of infections then if there is a risk of uh, um, of getting tested what Nicola has mentioned in the beginning and um, the importance of, of of testing at the start of a relationship and you don't necessarily have to have symptoms to get tested so we recommend that if you are uh, single having sex with other with you know different partners once every six months then sh you should get yourself checked so uh, if there is an infection obviously you don't transmit it to your sexual partner so you break the spread of, of infection uh, and then if you think you're at risk of HIV nowadays we have good prevention medicines that we uh, call PrEP or, or or and there is also another preventative strategy called PEP so these are medicines that you take either before the sex that's PrEP um, or after the sex happens what we call PEP and that will protect you from getting HIV what if you could start your journey over start here and start again there that's how life works in a circular way we understand the importance of circles, and that's why you are at the heart of ours. Find your way to wellness with Browns. So then a question relating to that HIV statistic, which is quite frankly harrowing, where in Malta are we specifically going wrong? Because we, you know, we're talking about 15.9% against, uh, let me just check those statistics before I say them out loud. <laughs> um, uh, we have 15.9% per 100,000 uh, 100, population with the EU average of 3.7. That's a phenomenal, phenomenal statistic. Where are we going wrong in Malta and why? I think maybe stereotypes and stigma has a lot to say about that, especially with HIV, maybe not being associated so much with something that a female can get. Um, there's stigma and shame around getting tested or being concerned if this is something that's could happen to me I, sometimes we can get caught up in this mindset that oh that's not something that's going to happen to me or I've only had sex once as we've been saying so there is still I think a lot of shame in in somebody coming forward to ask if this is a possibility to see a doctor where do I ask who do I go to so I think the fact that we're having this conversation and more conversations are being had is important because it can create a level of comfort and safety in somebody coming forward to ask questions about could this happen to me or how can I prevent it? But isn't this, I mean, this is really the pattern of the she word. We've talked about on this show, menstruation, menopause. We've talked about a whole bunch of topics that are not spoken about and yet a fundamental part of life. Yes, definitely. And sex is one of them. Yes, I don't know Malta, very many been, people. Um, I'm not entirely sure it's just Malta, but carry on. I think in Malta, sex has been a taboo for a very long time. You know, it's only very recently. But we that, wouldn't be here. I know. <laughs> but it was, you know, and um, it was like we were talking before, it was like 22 children. So women didn't have, um, weren't, were always with one partner, male, man, usually, I mean, in general, and they were at home all the time. Now we have a new area, you know, like you've been saying, you know, we have new problems that we we need to find new solutions. And um, for me, like what Duna was saying about the PrEP and the, I think that medication is not available now in it Malta. It's available, but it is not currently, it's not for free. Is that are, very expensive you know, now, as far I know as well. So we're waiting for the new uh, sexual so, health exactly. strategy, which so, will be coming out soon. Mm -hmm. and we uh, sorry, see. sorry. Yes. I, I, I don't mean to sound critical, mm -hmm. but Malta has the highest yes. rate of yes. HIV in Europe, mm -hmm. not by a little bit, but by 
what is the someone work out the math we're I know. effectively someone, talking I think three times as three, much no no four. it's not it's four, 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 four and a half yeah four and a half and yet the pre- preventative medication is not available it is available but it is against expensive yeah. against, um, and that's expensive uh, eh, uh-huh. as far as i yeah, know def- uh-huh. Uh, there are two different ways mm-hmm. how you can purchase it, like online versus uh, from pharmacies. But yes, not everyone can afford the PrEP, which is the preventative uh, medicine that you take before having the sex. It's in the range of 40 to 60 euros, depending on whether you buy it online or from a pharmacy for a month. So for a uh, 30 for day a supply. Uh, but the, the, the PEP, no, which is what you take afterwards. So after the sex happens, I tend to compare that to the morning after pill, mm-hmm. to the emergency contraception. So the sex happens, then you can take the morning after pill. If you think you've been exposed to HIV, you can take this PEP medicine. Obviously, you need to be seen by a sexual health doctor, get the necessary test. That's a, a month course of antivirus, of medicines that block the entry of the HIV virus into the body. But that costs around 600 hundred to seven hundred euros wow. yeah it is given for free in cases of non-consensual sex so when there is rape uh, but if the sex was consensual then you need to buy it so i'm going to come back to the question i just mm. asked where are we going wrong in Malta? Mm, i think that's one of your answers <laughs> yeah But if I might also add with those statistics, um, Mm. because we have to obviously dissect the statistics, um, at the moment we have around 400 uh, people living with HIV that are uh, with us uh, in care, okay? And obviously most of them are doing well and taking treatment and, you know, the level of the virus in in their blood is is what we call undetectable. So they cannot transmit the HIV virus to to their sexual partner. So this is obviously a phenomenon. Um, But... Looking at the statistics, obviously, uh, we had a massive influx of people living with HIV registering to the clinic. So there is only one public HIV clinic at the at kind of at Mother Day Hospital. But what happened is that they were living here on the island, but they were getting medicines from their home country. Okay, a lot of them are third, not all, but a lot of them are third country nationals. They are even sometimes from Europe. They used to go to their home country twice a year because they they are well under, you know, with under control. They go to their home country, they get the medicines, and we weren't aware of them. And then since COVID started, um, obviously the we flight they could back. not, okay. and then we were inundated with people. They're telling us, listen, I've been living with, with HIV for the last five years. I'm running out of medicine and then they registered to the clinic so they were also obviously responsible mm-hmm. for for the, the rise in the mm-hmm. statistics so there's a part of that okay part of that mm-hmm. well it uh, leads me on to we talked about safe sex or safer Fair. sex which i <laughs> am now but, uh, yes, definitely. um and i guess this question is more for you ladies because we would traditionally think that whether it be to prevent pregnancy or an sti that it would be the woman who may be more conscious because usually it's the woman who is more affected with regards to understanding safer sex simply because of, of pregnancy. Now, that then, lay, I'm not saying it's right. I'm saying it, that, yes. that no, no, if you I look at it statistically, yes, 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 most would regard the woman mm-hmm. as the person who is more conscious of being safer in sex because a woman has larger implications and if the woman has to carry the majority of the responsibility let's suggest for a second and i'm sure there's lots of people that would disagree how do you even go about broaching that subject and when because you you know in the old days it used to be how do you tell your partner that you want them to wear a condom Mm -hmm. now as you've mentioned how do you broach the subject of i i really really am enjoying you i'd like to you know being with you i'm enjoying this this is really cool i'd really like to make sure that we both have a a, a test before we go any further i happen to know a good friend of mine who did exactly that Mm -hmm. and the hats off to anyone that can but how do we'll come back to you but i'm looking at these two (laughs) ladies but how do how do we as women make sure that we have safer sex Mm -hmm. by insisting on these things because that's not something that's comfortable i know i think a huge part of it is starting to understand that this is all part of self-respect as well Mm -hmm. and I, i i've started to reflect a lot about Earlier you mentioned WHO and there's uh, 
various organizations that formed the sexual health principles. And for me, sex education and this conversation and so many of these topics are related so much to these principles, which if we teach them mm -hmm. to people in general, we might be more aware of how to tackle these. So one of these principles is protection, protection from STIs, from HIV and unwanted pregnancy. And a huge part of that is that I'm showing respect to you by having this conversation and also to myself by having this conversation. So if we put it in the mindset of this is a way I'm taking care of myself and not a burden I'm putting on my partner to go and lobby and get an appointment at et cetera, et cetera, is this not a way that we're taking care of ourselves and thinking about protecting not just my current state, but also my future because of potential repercussions. So if I'm more aware of the repercussions, it should push me more to try and take care of that. Now you might tell me easier said than done, and you're very right, very right. But I think that's where we need to go as a culture, where we're talking about these things and making it more comfortable and easier, you mentioned the inundated services, to come forward yes. because we need more of these services to have people be more oh, comfortable exactly. to come forward. Comfortable to come forward, to discuss. Um, we have to talk about sex in in more conversations with our children. It's not uncomfortable. We have to make not we have to make sure that it's not uncomfortable, you know, make it comfortable to talk about sex in all situations. Not it's like a taboo, like you know, you know, you're having sex, you know. You know, we should talk about it more because this is, I think, why there's this lack of knowledge because we don't talk about it openly. It's like a something still wrong and bad and sinful and mm -hmm. shameful and slutty. And if you know, mm -hmm. we still have those misconceptions, even with young generations. I mean, I was I went to university when I, like four years ago, so I was with 19 year olds. <laughs> <laughs> But I mean, I remember one of the girls and I, it was 2019 and she told me, you know, I, like, I enjoy sex, but, you know, I'm still um, spoken about by the boys. 2019, mm -hmm. a beautiful 19 year old girl mm -hmm. who told me this. And I said, what, this is still happening, that a girl is seen. She mm -hmm. said, I, she don't, she don't, not, not penetration. In fact, she said, not, not intercostal, but I like to mm -hmm. get off with boys and, you know, and I, you know, and mm -hmm. I was like, and you're serious, they're still talking about you. The boys and the girls are talking. It's like shame is a huge factor. Yeah, and it's, it's still definitely here, yeah, you know. I mean, yeah. Mm -hmm. But Fran, I'm asking you because so you have, have power, had more yeah. sex than anyone else at this yes, table. Exactly. So Lucky me. when <laughs> look at you, little expert lady. But when in your past mm -hmm. have you or have you been at a point where you you've you've been in a new relationship and you said, okay, now we need to talk about sex or now I need to ask him if he's happy to wear a condom or what, or now I need, I mean, is it not real? Because there's one thing about shame, but there's also that conversation. I can you remember as a kid, you know, as a, and as you a have teenager, to, uh, like having that conversation with my friends, with my girlfriends as a teenager, you know, you're getting a little bit fresh yes, and fruity yes, and maybe yes, it's going yes. in that direction and you're like, ooh, mm -hmm. I don't think I want to stop Facts, this. I mean, let's say, let's, be blunt. I mean, when I, my first sexual encounter was with a long-term boyfriend, I was still young and we didn't use a condom, but he, you know, it was withdrawal and it was still very popular in Malta, mm -hmm. withdrawal. So it's um, unfortunately a real reality, which I had my survey for contraception lately and con condoms were number one and withdrawal was, was number three. So condoms, um, the pill and then was withdrawal. So a lot of people still use the withdrawal, which is quite withdrawal method. So. But they're only concerned about the pregnancy. Exactly, exactly. yes, exactly. A lot of people tell That's me, exactly. oh, but no, I did not use a condom because uh -huh. I'm on the pill. Exactly, so exactly. I say, of course, that is going to protect you against unwanted, unintended pregnancy, See, but I, it's going to do not nothing only, against... It won't even against... because very likely it's not a very good hmm. method. It's <laughs> not a very safe method. <laughs> so but spread... yes, exactly. You know, it doesn't... But it does doesn't nothing, nothing to... Exactly, and not needed as the pill, eh? So I'm going to throw this into the center of the table, mm -hmm. okay? And I'm going to ask you, ladies, to to uh, to comment and and give an answer to this question because yes, we need to talk about it more, and that's why we're doing shows like this. But if you're a let's say a 22 year old woman and you're with a partner, I want some practical points. You're saying if you go into a new relationship, go get your test yourself tested. Would it not apply that if you come out of a relationship, maybe that's a good time to get tested as well? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And how do you then broach the topic? I mean, I'm asking you, ladies, because yeah. I'm putting words into your mouth. I mean, but this, just some yeah. points, some absolute points that our mm-hmm. our she worders can go. Okay, mm-hmm. now I need to do this. Mm-hmm. This kind of overlaps also with the topic of consent, where mm-hmm. it's something you've mentioned. Kind of we're coming to that. Yeah, you've sure. mentioned kind of stopping sex to put on a condom can be so unsexy, mm-hmm. and stopping someone to ask for consent can be so unsexy. But if you if you're you know if we're looking at and reframing things isn't it sexy mm-hmm. to have somebody tell you yes i want this and exactly. yes i would sexy. i want you to put this on and yes let's do it this way mm-hmm. so it, it's about empowerment and i really appeal to parents as well to have these conversations exactly and that's we, and empower we your, your girls especially i think because boys mm-hmm. are more for, forthcoming and like um in that um, the sex and intimacy the penis is always there they see it they hit hold it you know so boys are more open about sex than girls i think yeah. So yeah. we have to talk to our girls and empower our girls to know that it's okay to have sex. It's, you know, as long as you as safe as possible, mm-hmm. talk about it. Okay, so parents need to talk yeah. to their kids because there might be and it's a not great enough to school just say, system, go on but the we pill. can't take mm-hmm. it for granted that there is. So that means that parents also need to do their research and they need to be up to date. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Girls need to be empowered to say, you know what? I want to have, I, I respect you, but I respect myself yeah. more. And all mm-hmm. genders. But all yeah. genders, yes. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. But obviously the, within this context, we're of talking about anything else, maybe getting tested. Getting tested, yes. I normally tell them, sometimes I'm dealing with these young, young I call them patients, obviously mm-hmm. they're not really patients, <laughs> clients. Um, and they tell me, but um, I did tell him to get tested, for example, but mm-hmm. he didn't want, for example. So I'm here to test myself. I say, wow, wow well done. Congratulations, mm-hmm. young lady. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're, doing the, you're doing the right thing. You're here to get tested. But would you want to have sex with someone who is not respectful? Exactly. Then they pause, they stop. Mm-hmm. They tell me, but you're right. Mm-hmm. Exactly. He's not respecting exactly. That's where the empowerment yeah, exactly, comes in, exactly. right? Exactly. And, uh, and you use this motivation interviewing, mm-hmm. not just like, no, you should tell him exactly. to get it. That won't no, work. No, that won't true. work with all of ages, but especially the younger age groups. Mm-hmm. So you stop. So, and I say, so you're okay with him not getting tested. So here you are. You're seeing how simple the testing is. It's mm-hmm. not painful or anything of the sort. And you're going to go back. So you, you have a clear result, but you don't know his results. So you're having sex with him. You're potentially going to come back to my clinic next week yeah. now with an infection you got to yourself that's yeah, exactly. it he's not tested do you want to have sex with him he's mm-hmm. not you know you you've told you know, you're him putting you're putting yourself yeah, in so, danger yeah, in a way exactly. it's a very good you could point. also go together that's a practical yes, way to go exactly. about it exactly. go together yeah, make it the fun test involved because you said it's painless so like <laughs> obviously it is, is exactly very, yeah, so it's is very like, simple yeah. so in men we check the urine for mm-hmm. um for chlamydia and gonorrhea and women it's a swap from the vagina which can can be self done so it's not Pain. I mean, the smear yes. test is not painful, but it's a bit more uncomfortable. But it can be a self-taken. It oh, feels good. like a tampon being inserted okay. inside the vagina. And then if they want the blood testing for HIV and syphilis, that's from a, a, a blood sample. And making it very normal. Yes. Mm. Like that. Normalize like you just said, it's normalizing. Just, yeah, exactly. Normalize it. Normalize, yeah. normalize it. it. Just normalize. like I think Nicola mentioned that we go to the dentist every six months. Yes. A lot of women go to the gynae every year and we don't kind of make a much fuss about it. But are oh, going to the geo clinic to get tested. Uh-huh. No, I would go to the gynae, but I won't go to the geo mm. clinic again because of the yes. stigma associated with it. That reminds me about the smear test. They don't all, they don't show that you have no. Uh, an STI, another right? Very another another misconception. So I tell women, have you ever tested for STIs before? And they tell me yes. I you test every sips, year for the test. but it's not the same test. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah, so having a smear test is not enough. No. Not just enough. to de- to detect yeah. which I didn't know as well, you know. I mean I got to know the last couple of years. Yes. Like I was like, okay. Yeah. We're talking about safer sex. And I want to raise something that, that Nicola mentioned just a few minutes ago. Um, and the, and a, a sad, I find a very sad statistic that 8%, 87% of women have had sex when they didn't want to, whether to get out of a situation or because they're too embarrassed to say no. Now, we're not talking about sexual assault. We're talking about having sex with someone when you really don't want to do it. I know, and I'm going to put my hand up and say, I have definitely done that without a shadow of a doubt. But of course, if you're in that situation and actually you just want to get out the room and you just know that this is the easiest route because you are a woman and if you say no, you know that there might be repercussions, then 
you also are putting yourself at risk, both physically, but also you are definitely not going to be able to ask that partner, hey, listen, have you been tested recently? Because that's not your dialogue. That's not what's going to happen. So when is it right to say no? And this is this is more of the physical and, and emotional. When is it right to say no? And how do we empower women to say no to sex without getting into uh, a difficult situation without being fe- without feeling that they are having to negotiate or being threatened it's always right to say no absolutely always and what's really important and maybe complex about consent is that consent needs to be ongoing Mm -hmm. and this is something that gets very blurred very easily is that if I gave consent at this moment to have oral sex let's say I didn't automatically give consent for penetration for anal sex for toys for this that and the other so consent needs to be affirmative needs to be honest needs to be sober and needs to be ongoing yes so there are ways to go about it but It's also about, this goes back to what I said in the beginning, about creating a a mindset. If we're teaching kids, teens, people, anybody, that we are to be alert, let's say, for sexual exploitation, you mentioned that this isn't in the case of sexual abuse. If we start looking at what is exploitation in general, can I, let's talk to my kids about this is right, this is wrong, not just about sex, so that when we are then experiencing something in a relationship, we can point it out easier, get out of that situation easier, not get there in the first place. So again, I go back to the shifting mindsets. But in the moment, it is absolutely always okay to have to say no. Mm -hmm. Absolutely always. There's a fantastic video, which probably everybody has heard about by now, about tea tea. tea and (laughs) consent. Mm -hmm. It, It makes it so simple. I could be saying, yes, now I fall asleep, I'm, I'm unconscious, I'm not consenting. Mm-hmm. I could have said, yes, I'm awake, I'm excited about it, I'm affirmative about it, but it now I, I withdrew, something mind. came exactly. up for me. So this is what really needs to stay in your mind. It's, if, mm-hmm. if you, even if it's just a mood switch, even something yes. came up, you have every right S- to, to stop it. Stop. Absolutely, every but right. But I think every woman can relate and maybe I'm putting myself out there, but I think everyone, can, one, every single woman can relate to having had sex at some point when they really would rather not have done that. Now, that's not necessarily, <clears throat> but but you don't. I think... I, I, uh, I want to say about there are very there are a lot of good men. I've been in situations where I've said stop, no, no more, and it's been in a very in or out situation you know so don't be afraid to say no because most men are good men there you know we we have to be careful mm. as well we mustn't um think that all men are bad so absolutely not be, be empowered to say no this is not i'm not feeling right now i'm sorry i changed my mind you know and most men are going to say it's okay honey we'll we'll you know we'll we'll, we'll talk about it and move on let's go to dinner you know <laughs> for example at least that was my experience you know i was and when I look back, I said, okay, was I really lucky or was, I think well, there are men that are nice guys or maybe I choose my guys, you know, I don't know. But um, I've been in that situation where I've said, no, stop. And people have stopped. And I've been in situations where they've said, I've said, stop, and they haven't. But um, not all, you know, it's, you know, there are, we're not talking about assault. We're talking about consens- consensual sex. And I think you raised a really mm-hmm. good point, both of you, because sometimes it comes down to a woman not having the courage to say no. Mm. And if you actually use that word and say, actually, you know what, I, I, let's not, I, I don't want to do this, then yes. then maybe, mm. hopefully, as you said, most most men are good men and they would mm. take that as a, as a no. Yes. But we have to be empowered as women. Yeah. We have to share that, that it's mm. okay mm. to say no. Yes, exactly. That the expectation, just because you kissed a guy, just yes. because he's touched he's your boobs. He's about to enter you and you can just, change your mind, exactly. you know. Exactly. And in any relationship. Be open, you know, exactly. You can yeah. be about to have sex, you could be naked, lying down together, and you change your mind. You're like, listen, no, I'm not feeling up to it. No. And in any relationship, a marital relationship, exactly. a same-sex Anything. relationship, exactly. it exactly. applies regardless. Across, exactly. And it's about looking for an enthusiastic yes, mm-hmm. more so than waiting for a no. Mm-hmm. But that no for the person that is taking back, not giving, whatever you want to say, consent, it's very important. Both those words are very important. 
giving an enthusiastic yes, yes, yes is as important as knowing how to say no. Mm-hmm. Because if I am able to enthusiastically say yes, then I am, you know, empowered then exactly. probably to, to say no, to say exactly. no as well. So equi- it's equally important. Mm-hmm. We focus so much on the no, yes, but, but you yes. know, it also comes back to maybe shame or that women shouldn't be so open or we should wait for the other partner to approach. But really, you know, realistically, we are as eager as any other one, any other person. So why not also focus on the enthusiastic yes? Mm-hmm. I love that. I love yeah, the enthusiastic, enthusiastic yes. yes, definitely. <laughs> having a conversation with a very dear friend of mine and we were talking about this in in detail and she mentioned that she'd been in a situation this is a number of years ago where where he was very eager there'd been alcohol involved so obviously that then that clouds decisions that can be made and she just said you know what I just wanted to get out go home and I knew that this was the quickest route so she didn't say no she just didn't want to do it but there was definitely no enthusiastic yes. And I love, exactly. I love that. Let's talk about alcohol and drugs just for a second, because these are definitely more part of our our society than they have been in the past. And they're definitely very present here in Malta. But for women, and we're not, again, look, let's not talk about abuse. We're not talking, we're not even going there. This is a whole different mm-hmm. show. Mm-hmm. Today, we're just talking about happy, mm-hmm. healthy sex, mm-hmm. which is safer sex, mm-hmm. healthy <laughs> I'm going to wake up in the middle of the night going, it's safer sex. sex. It's safer sex. (laughs) Safer sex. sex. But I'm assuming as well, and I I want to be utterly realistic because there are a lot of people, there's a lot of women, there's a lot of men in society who enjoy recreational drugs. And now, of course, recreational drugs have been decriminalized. So, of course, they're part of our society as well. And we all... Drink. enjoy very good wine of course we do or <laughs> beer or, or the equivalent most of us do but what then is would be the implications of that so that we're just aware I know it sounds really obvious but give me some wise thoughts on involving drugs and alcohol when it comes to sex be- and how that affects safer <laughs> sex yeah, the, the effects, the repercussions are, are varied. So looking at, obviously, the, the big one is the consent, but obviously we're not going to go there. But if you're drunk, you cannot give consent. Um, so that's that's one thing. Sorry, I'm going to stop you. That's massive. Say that again. If you're mm. drunk, you cannot give consent. Legally. Yes, exactly. Even consent legally, doesn't yes. apply. I just want to stop that and get you to say that once more, because I really, I, I don't think I've ever heard anyone actually say it as clearly as that. If you're drunk, you cannot give, give consent. consent. Exactly. Legally, you cannot give. So what are the implications of that? That this is non-consensual sex. So someone can also, mm-hmm. you know, press charges and take you to court for having sex with them when you when they were drunk mm-hmm. and they didn't give you consent to have sex. So keep in mind already how blurry mm-hmm. these kinds of situations are. Add drugs and alcohol to that. Mm-hmm. And you have Can you imagine how f- more complicated it is? Yeah. That's huge. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. I just wanted to stop yes, and, yes. and reflect no, on that for one but there's second. But there's a spectrum of drinking, right? And drugs. I suppose you can be totally drunk and that's yes. when you can't give consent, mm-hmm. but you can be tipsy and that's going to lower your inhibitions and maybe mm-hmm. make you yeah. more less safe. Yeah. So I think that's yeah. where we have to be careful. So when we, um, when we drink drugs and alcohol, I suppose, yeah. we have to... Remember the safe, safer sex. Yeah. I think that's the problem. What yeah. 
A when... lot of, exactly, yes. A lot of people, they tell me, for example, I always use condoms when mm. I have sex. But last time, you know, I was I was drunk. No, or drinking, I was drinking, drinking, exactly. And I forgot all about the condoms. Mm-hmm. I didn't, I wasn't empowered enough, mm-hmm. you know, I wasn't uh, maybe there mm-hmm. fully enough to, to say, no, you have to wear a condom. So um, alcohol and drugs are more likely to end up uh, in riskier sex okay and more than unprotected sex maybe that you're mentioning drugs obviously there are many drugs that can Mm. be taken before or during sexual activity okay so um, cocaine ecstasy mdma there are obviously many Um, and there are various reasons why people choose to take drugs they might have low self-esteem they might um, be shy in asking someone to have sex with them or to to go out and mingle if they're not under the effect of alcohol or drugs so obviously we know that alcohol and drugs reduce our our mm. inhibitions exactly. but there is also i'll call it a new phenomenon although it's no longer that mm. much new it's called chem sex i'm not sure whether yes. any of you has heard of yes. it but it is the combination of chemicals uh-huh. and sex yeah. okay so if you have sex it's the use of specific drugs okay there are three different ones that are used i will not, not go into the details but uh, crystal meth and uh, methadrone and these drugs are specifically taken before or during sexual activity they reduce inhibitions but they also relax um, the anal area the anal muscle so they're more likely to be used although not only but by men having sex with men okay and they end up having unprotected anal sex usually sex that is prolonged that is you know a whole day long or many hours with more than one different person they wouldn't even know who they're having sex with it's a very common phenomenon nowadays and then they come to the clinic on monday they don't really know what has happened over the weekend and obviously we find a lot of infections because Mm -hmm. you're having sex with more than one person at the same time people that you don't know unprotected you said there that it's common Mm -hmm. i'm assuming that it's it's on the increase Mm -hmm. when we say common is this something that it's just in one part of the island or it's something that happens with tourists are we talking about seriously common seriously common seriously common and been around for a while while. yes Uh, that's why i said it's not that common Mm -hmm. but maybe we don't talk about it that much but for statistics if you wait for early next year Mm -hmm. after the geo clinic we're doing a survey on chemsex use to understand the the severity because i know obviously that it is common because Mm -hmm. we ask about it in the Mm -hmm. clinic and most of the answers is yes i've used it or in the past or i'm still using it but to actually get a statistics we're doing a a chemsex survey in mm-hmm. our clinic so i'll come back on the show with the yes. statistics yeah okay that's fine <laughs> we'll do that we'll do a whole show when you get those statistics i can guarantee it you were nodding your head there so this is obviously something that you are also familiar with yes i mean i haven't worked uh, directly with with clients that are having some kind of issues with this particular topic but i'm aware of it and i'm nodding because of the fact that we're just talking about consent and how blurred it can get and then add this length of time and this amount of risks so how much more information and education we need before we do these kinds of things no shame to anybody that engages in chem sex or any kind of sex i mean this isn't about judgment or uh, it's just about being aware of what we're doing before we do it right so that's why i'm (laughs) really excited to hear about these statistics because Mm. it's important to have this information and when this information lacks in a country that's when there isn't educational practices for it because we don't know of its existence right we don't even have a sexual health policy Mm. It's being updated as we speak. I mean, has so it's been it being up. updated yes. it for <laughs> like 20, since 2012 and it was already outdated when it came out. So <laughs> a country we... without a sexual health policy, I don't think that's a very good mm-hmm. indication of our can I, sexual Can I ask you, and, and this is a non-judgmental question, but bearing in mind that maybe 20 years ago sex was not something we talked about and, it, and probably wasn't as as open or... Uh, you know, in some instances promiscuous or uh, as it is now. Is one GU clinic enough in Malta? <laughs> Hot question. No, no it isn't Definitely enough. Definitely not. So um, obviously as awareness has increased mm-hmm. throughout the years, the attendance at the uh, 
at the geo clinics um, in in Mas in Mater Day has has obviously increased. So did the population increase mm -hmm. that we have obviously faced in, in a very short period of time has brought with it obviously more people, more demand for services. And obviously we welcome the the increase in demand because that means that you know these shows yes. are doing their mm -hmm. effect. People are learning about mm -hmm. the importance of getting tested, so we get more people to get tested. Obviously we have the the main hospital, the main clinic is in Mater Dei Hospital. There are a number of peripheral private clinics across the island. I'm also doing a geoclinic in Gozo Hospital, which started, I think, in May, not of last year, but 2021. Um, so that is happens every fortnight in Gozo. Um, now, there are talks as we speak about decentralization of services. So watch the space. Very soon there will be peripheral clinics um, testing um, for SDIs in, 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 in the community. And that is happening no, very soon. Which is Absolutely. really good, good because news. the reason I ask that is because we are right here on this show between us, we are promoting safer sex. And if we are encouraging women and, of course, men to be safer in their sexual practice, that means we are sending them to you. <laughs> so <laughs> it's good news to hear. And also, of course, the going to to the central hospital to Mater Dei, even stupid things like parking mm. can be obstructive mm -hmm. to someone going yes. through the doors of the largest hospital in Malta can be obstructive. And then even seeking private medical health care, if you don't have the finances to do that, yeah. then that's also obstructive. And what we want is safer sex. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm going to come back to the fact that we, we talked about trends we talked about sexual behavior changing and one thing that has changed over the last 10 years dramatically and I'm not asking anyone at the table to be an expert on this but one of the things that's changed dramatically with the advent of the internet is porn and access to porn back in the day you'd go into the <laughs> news agency it was up there it had a cover on women definitely couldn't reach the top <laughs> shelf i don't know if it was the I same don't think they in, even had them in they even Malta. had them here okay it was, it was all <laughs> censored in my time when i was young it was censored you didn't find anything you didn't see there were no magazines in the well, it's one of the largest, fastest growing yes, industries definitely. in the world and all the implications that go with that. And a study reveals that eight out of 10 people living in the north, namely Gargu, Maliha, um, Umja, Mosta, Nashar and St. Paul's Bay area, said that they watch pornography. Eight out of 10. So there is a growing trend in pornography with the advent of the internet. What is the impact you mentioned about this, and I yes. want to come back. What is the impact on sexual health with this? Because what we see is not necessarily what we should be doing. Yeah. So the first thing I'd like to say, because this is very important, and porn is a very, a very controversial topic, but to date, there is no statistical confirmation that there is any causation between porn and mental health or porn and sexual health issues. A does not equal B, Okay. But if, let's say, I struggle with self-esteem, so I have a pre-existing difficulty, and I am using porn because I'm not comfortable to go out on a date, there is where an issue is created. So just to put the frame of mind, porn itself is not an issue. It's how we're using it and how we're not being critical towards it. So some impacts could be that if I already am a misogynist and I already have certain views of women, Watching certain kinds of porn can encourage me more yes. to think that sex needs to be violent, aggressive, penetrative, hard, etc. Okay. But it's not porn that's the issue. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm very much, I actually focused my bachelor's dissertation some years ago on attitudes towards pornography. And my research showed that attitudes have changed in the sense that we view pornography more positively. But what's lacking is our critical thinking about it. So, if we are, I mean, realistically, if we look at the mainstream porn, it's very heteronormative, very heterosexual, it lacks consent, it lacks protection, it lacks a lot of different things. So we do get a misconception mm -hmm. of what sex looks like, mm -hmm. and we shouldn't learn mm -hmm. what sex looks like from there. Mm -hmm. but, but hang on a second, Fran and I both said 
when we were growing up, there was very little sex education and we didn't have access or to porn. I mean, my brother, he'll kill me, but he had them under his bed, you know, and I knew that they were there and it was all experimental. But now I'm fairly, well, I know statistically young people, young people, Mm -hmm. lower than teens have access to pornography. That is their vision. If they're not getting that guidance from home or from school, that's what their vision of sex is going to be. As young as eight. Eight, As young as eight. So they're going to be going into a sexual relationship thinking having that as their point of reference. And that's why porn, a lot of countries have introduced porn literacy into their sex education. Mm. Have we? Mm-hmm. No, we I haven't. Mean, I don't think I have. Yeah, no, no. Uh, to my knowledge. But it's been a while since I did this research. Um, but some con- that was one of my recommendations, that in some countries, porn literacy, something actually called porn literacy yes. was included, where we are, you know... Critical. And yeah, can, critical can about critic, it. You know, At the same time, it is a tool. It's critical, sort of yeah, thing. There's it's a lot okay. of different mm-hmm. perspectives on porn, and, mm-hmm. and it, there, ha- there are certain benefits in exploring fantasies and learning more about what you're interested in. Couples use it. I mean, there's a lot of things to say about it, but in terms of your question of impact, there are some ways it can impact, but it's not inherently porn as a problem. Um, and that's, I think... The problem if an eight-year-old is watching it. An yes, that is the not only... usually ex- having sex either, yeah. if you know what I mean. So, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. so, so that's, yeah. that's when there is a you problem. Know? Of course, if children being exposed to any kind of sexual information before it is uh, appropriate, yeah, exactly that is when there is harm. Exactly. So porn is harmful to children, that is... Mm. Definitely. But I did read a study in the US, and I'll cite it on, mm. on the, the page so that anyone else can, can read it if they want. Uh, the, the increase in porn uh, and the access to more hardcore porn meant that for men to become firm and to be able to, to, to have sex increased the level of expectation relating to a porn-related activity. Mm -hmm. So in other words, whereas a guy might be able to get turned on by a bit of a snog and a kiss and a bit of a touch, because they're actively watching porn and using it, now they need much higher uh, interaction, stimulation. Stimulation. Yeah, stimulation. Thank That's you. I was word. looking exactly. for the word. <laughs> <laughs> Always reference you to for those lovely <laughs> words. Dawn, yeah, she puts the words, and the surely, right words. <laughs> exactly. And surely that then it comes back again to consent, mm-hmm. but that also increases expectation on w- women. Is that a massive, maybe even a sexist assumption, or are we actually seeing this in real life? I would say it is an issue. I mean, definitely couples come forward or women come forward with this being an issue that there's, you know, certain expectations of how the sex should look like and what shame around not like exactly. It's exactly it's shame about what we should look like and what the vagina should look like mm-hmm. and blah, 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 blah. So it is true, but mm-hmm. it's definitely true what you're saying. But that's then when there is an issue, right? So when there is an issue in a relationship, when there is a, a dynamic that's not working in terms of sex, this is when what we start looking at. What porn are you seeing? What are the expectations? And that's where we mediate the conversation between couples or individuals that are having any difficulties in this regard. But it, that could be a potential reality where we are creating different expectations because of the vast types of pornography that there are. So to pop that into a, a nutshell, what you're actually saying is, and I'm going to just start off and then ask you to to kind of put that into bullet point, that porn itself is not the problem. Yeah. So That's bullet point number one, over to you for the rest of them, because I want to just make is, sure we get this really yeah. clear. I mean, there's a lot of different perspectives on it and there's we can discuss it for days, right? It is harmful to children. Children should not be watching porn. We agree on that. But uh, children too, again, I'm going to pr- try and break this down. So to what age? What age is OK to be watching porn? Yeah, so that's, a- <laughs> that's another question. I mean, you, 16 is the age, age of, consent. of consent here, yeah. but that varies. Yes, yeah. But I mean, I don't know. Mm-hmm. And I think it's it's different for there are girls maybe are more. Oh, like a mature, maybe at 13, 14. I, I don't know. I mean, I'm not an expert. We need a child. <laughs> <laughs> well, to <laughs> my knowledge, at least in terms of website, exactly. generally it's 18, 18 plus. Exactly. Yeah. So if you're looking at specific websites, they will ask you yeah. to confirm your age. And 18. it's normally 18 I mean, plus. What it should be, I'm don't not going to pretend to know. No, okay. Exactly. <laughs> but we can use 18 that as is like good 18 if it's, is a guy. Exactly. Yeah. But also, I mean, 
there's a lot of different things to be said. I, I believe there was in some particular episode where we discussed the developmental age and that mm, exactly. we actually continue developing our brain until 23 mm. to 25. I mean, yeah. there's a lot of different things exactly. to say. But I think my point is in that, I mean, it's not about being pro-porn or anti-porn. It's about understanding exactly. it as a, uh, its in entirety, yeah, right? Exactly, because yeah. it does have implications for some, I'm yeah. sure. I mean, there is addiction now. Porn, mm -hmm. People are addicted to porn. Oh. That, no, no, because <laughs> I like from your study, because you say you started off with saying that um, the research doesn't show um, causation or... But UK, does it show, UK research uh, has definitely, addiction. and this is not recent research. This is 20 years ago, mm -hmm. and I happened to look into it because it affected me personally. Mm -hmm. Not me, but the person that yes, I was with. Yes, exactly. Yes. Porn, porn addiction is addi and, uh, can be can addictive, be. Uh -huh. can be addictive, mm -hmm. yeah. but you have to have a mental um, tenders, a mental state towards that that has a tendency yeah. towards so, addiction. Mm -hmm. and exactly. And there addiction. isn't a classification for sex addiction or porn addiction. It doesn't exist uh, in yeah, the okay. DSM, in the Diagnostic Manual of Mental Disorders, nor the ICD, which is the UK version, the International Classification of Disease. Neither sex addiction nor porn addiction classify Okay. So as addictions, addictions, they do not exist. We talk about compulsive sexual behavior. And to classify, to be diagnosed with a compulsive sexual behavior is very difficult because we have to be very careful not to stigmatize sexual frequency. Just because I have sex twice a day, it doesn't mean I'm a sex addict or I have compulsive sexual behavior. It is if it's affecting my daily functioning, if I'm not going to work, if I'm not engaging with friends, if I'm not... Mm. Spoke yes. it all the time. Exactly. Yeah. So it's it's very important that we do not stigmatize frequency of sex or... or mm. But definitely there could be compulsive sexual behavior, which could be compulsive porn use. If I can't leave the workplace before I've seen a uh, porn or masturbated, there could be an issue there. Spending all night watching porn and not mm -hmm. going to bed with your wife, for example. Mm -hmm. I've heard of this, you know, mm -hmm. quite yeah. a few So it could come times, into play, you know? It could come, come into play, yeah. Mm -hmm. And issues in, in relationships yes, as well. Yes, exactly. It's yeah. So some people aren't comfortable with their yes. partners watching porn. They consider that as cheating, yes, they consider for example. It's cheating. Mm -hmm. It's very big that, that mm -hmm. they consider it as cheating. I know, listen, we're going to do another show because yes. <laughs> Dora said that we have to. But to, to, to sort of summarize that, if a, if a woman is experiencing her partner is a frequent, is one of those eight out of ten, maybe she's comfortable with that, maybe she's not. But what is the right, the safer approach to porn? Well, one of the things that's the basis of many of these episodes that you've had is communication, exactly. right? Communication, I mean, right. it is another topic that couples need to talk about from the get-go. What are our, our boundaries? We tend to assume automatically that we're going to be exclusive, that we're not going to watch porn, that we don't masturbate. I mean, these are assumptions that we may or may not have, but that's why we need to eliminate them as assumptions. What are we comfortable with? Are you comfortable with me masturbating? I am a strong believer in having a sexual, uh, an individual sexuality and a coupled yes. partner sexuality. Yes. So, but these are conversations to be had in in a relationship. Okay, sorry, women, sorry, sorry, sorry. A lot of women sorry. are very paranoid about masturbation. If they even okay. with they, well, let's men talk now. about mm -hmm. that because. I've never heard that on a show either, where even Antonella didn't say that, I don't believe, where you said <laughs> that there is a an individual yes. sexuality and there is a, a couple. Yes, she's very right. I, well, Fran wants to jump in there. <laughs> no, 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 I'm agreeing with her. She's, yes, she's yes, the but expert. Explain, I, no. explain. I mean, no, one of you... Uh, nothing wrong, I think, by pleasuring yourself and knowing yourself. It's part of the, you know, journey of, of, have a sexual, yeah. of our sexual being. And if you know yourself, you can have very likely better, better sex, sex and also um, be more empowered 
mm-hmm. as well to say no and say what I like, what you don't like, what you want, what you expect, like the communication, you know. most men would, or women even, would expect that to stop in the context of a relationship, Yes, a lot of, yes men, um, women, I don't think men so much, but I think women, they don't like to know that their husbands might be masturbating when they're not around, for example. Mm-hmm. I've, no, I've come across that. Maybe it's changing. But... Yeah, it's, it's not my experience. Yeah. I mean, at least people around me, if I'm going to talk on a personal level, there tends to be more open conversations about people being aware couple, that their partners, yeah, yes, yes. being That's aware that the partners know. masturbate. I think the difference is on whether this must co- be our generation. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there are. I'm sure there are still. <laughs> Did you see that sneaky little look from Fran? She's like looking at me, going, "You move. <laughs> We're screwed, girlfriend." Um, but certainly, I mean, <laughs> yeah, th- there are probably uh-huh. there are always different. Yes dynamics and different people with different expectations right but I think there is an improvement on the topic of masturbation but in terms of you know individual sexuality let's be frank if I am somebody that masturbates I probably know how to make myself orgasm the best and the quickest right (laughs) and that's completely okay that's completely okay and I can have it takes me longer maybe with my partner and that's also okay you know, it doesn't need to be the exact same sex I have by myself is the same that I have with oh, my partner. Exactly. Yeah. Sexual fantasy, mm-hmm. not everything I can discuss or do with my partner. So why not kind of have these dynamics and conversations to determine what we're comfortable with? As You know what I'm envisaging? I'm env- envisaging a show with you and Antonella. That, that would be <laughs> mind-blowing. In fact, Love I was that. going to tell her, she's not the typical norm I don't know of you maybe and you're how old are you sorry 29 29 very young how nice <laughs> again <laughs> could, could she's be, could be my is daughter. looking at me thanks could be my daughter but I don't think you're the typical 29 year old you're very open about I mean you've studied you you know as in you've studied the subject so do you really consider that 29 year olds are take a 29 year old who maybe got married young and even didn't have a lot of sexual, would she be as open as you know, right? That's what oh, I mean. And no. and they, that's where I mean when I say, I think um, they wouldn't like it if their husband wants to be, because mm-hmm. they're the only probably sexual partner they've had, you know? Um, Definitely. I mean, previously, yeah. I, I've I've worked with clients for psychosexual mm. education, mm. where I would be helping individuals with any mm. kind of psychosexual problems on an education level. Mm-hmm. And I did have an... I would say an alarming amount of women, young women coming forward with vaginismus, mm. which you mentioned, yes. for example, which is something, again, very much not talked, talked about, about enough, definitely. And it's surprising. Can you say that again? Because I missed it, which means she worders might have missed mm. it and not coming enough, coming forward enough to talk about what? Vaginismus. So vaginismus is, so there's there's three different kinds of sexual function problems in women. There's pain, there's um, arousal and desire, and um, the last one being climax. So when it comes to pain, there are different forms. One of them is vaginismus, and this is an involuntary spasm of the muscle. So the vagina is basically a muscle, two muscles on top of each other that expand once we're getting aroused. But in the case of somebody who has vaginismus, the muscles clamp tighter. There's many reasons to talk about that. We can do a whole show about that. But a lot of women aren't aware that this can happen so when then they experience sex for the first time and find this literal wall, it's very scary. It's very alarming. A lot of women don't come forward to talk about it until they want to have a child. So they could have a marriage without sex, for example, and then uh, we want to have children. We need to deal with that now. This common? Common. How common? Oh. I don't have statistics, um, from at experience. least for Malta, but I think I saw somewhere that around 6 to 7% of female function, sexual function problems are vaginismus. So it's the most common sexual function problem for women out of all of them, out of desire discrepancy, out of arousal issues, climax issues. We're the same generation. I love the fact that Fran is nodding because she knows what you're talking about. And I'm just saying, sitting here, I'm going to be really honest. Never heard of that before. Mm-hmm. Literally. Not, and I'm from on, the UK. You're not on Women for Women enough. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, wow. <laughs> no, let me tell you why. Because that's where I learned all this. I didn't know. I, You know, someone asked about vaginismus and what to, what she should do. And I, I was like, okay, what's that? I need to know. I, so I would I Google everything, every new word that comes up on the group. I Google it and I look and I research and I 
<laughs> I ask Donia very often about stuff, you know. Um, so, which leads me very didn't nicely know about it, so to it's a penultimate question. I know you're sitting there going, "Good grief, this is really heading towards the end of the show." Not possibly. <laughs> yes, we'll do another one. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, but if there is a she word a listening to this show, and any of the topics that have been talked about today have touched her or him. Where do they seek help? Because literally you're using terms I've not heard before and ashamedly you're 20 years younger than me. God, grief. And you're talking about the fact that if it wasn't for Women for Women, you know, so I'm assuming Women for Women is a good place to start. Yes, and you can send me a message if they need. I can guide them to other professionals. If they, you know, everything they tell me is confidential, they can send Women me. Women for Women is on Facebook, Facebook on yes. Instagram. Yes, um, I'm Francesca Fenneconti. They can message me. Many people do um, by private message and everything's totally confidential. They keep their, I'll definitely anonymous and I can ask for them. I mean, we have a lot of the topics also on wham.com.mt, which we, um, which is a website that I created during wham as in w h a m dot com dot m t was something so that, yes, yes, well. yes, because um, Donia has written some articles as well. Um, it was something I created during uh, COVID but when I saw, you know, let's do something. There's not enough awareness of women's health and sexual health and reproductive health and uh, pregnancy and issues. There's a lot on the internet about everything, but it's all from a, not from a local perspective. Mm -hmm. You can find about pregnancy, you can find about, but from a local perspective, there's really little. So I thought, and, and it came about because a foreign woman told me, listen, I'm, I'm trying to get pregnant. What's the thing I, I've been looking, I've been Googling one of the women from the group. I said, you know, you're right. There's nothing from a local perspective. You know, if you go, the government thing, it's one paragraph about pregnancy, go to the ops and gyne, you know, blah, blah, blah. So your knowledge of the term that you, vagin, vagin, vaginismus, vaginismus. Uh -huh. I like, I like the word. It's kind of <laughs> cool. <laughs> it is. Vaginismus. Your knowledge of that came from Women for Women and Wham. Yes, uh, Women for Women, someone asking, and then obviously we... I, I, you so know, this is a good place to start asking, if you exactly. just want to know more information. Yes, yes, of course, to go to the professionals. But, but Nicola, <laughs> if somebody is experiencing any of the things that you've discussed, whether it be, you know, struggling to be empowered enough to say no or struggling with with. How do you say Vaginismus. <laughs> I know, I'm going to wake up in the morning going, Vaginismus. <laughs> um, or any of these, these issues, how does a woman seek help? I think a huge thing that gives me a lot of hope is that there's more and more developing professionals in the country. There are a lot of existing professionals that work with sexual health and sexual problems in general. So there are places to go. And something we didn't mention, and I'll just mm. make it brief, is that we look at sex from a biopsychosocial model, right? So, so there's the biological component of sex. That's where Donia comes in, where gynees come in and medical the medical approach so that's always a good place to start if you're having sexual pain go to the, go to the gynae figure out if there's anything physically wrong mm -hmm. maybe there is some kind of medical issue there's the psychological there are various mental health professionals sexual health professionals sex therapists psychosexual educators that you can reach out to um to learn more about this topic one-to-one -one sessions or even um there are talks many different talks around the island and then there's also the social aspect, and this is what we're doing, right? We're, we're looking at culturally what are the issues and relationship history. There's so many parts that form part of the social part. But wherever you feel comfortable to start, mm -hmm. start. Exactly. It could be from the social, from talking to Francesca, exactly. from looking exactly. up at that Facebook group, mm -hmm. seeing what professionals are replying, yes, exactly. reaching out to professionals. There's nothing wrong with asking a question yes, exactly. to a doctor, to a professional, to exactly. mental health professional. So I'm... My point is that I'm I am also as a professional encouraged that there are a lot of yes. colleagues that I feel so happy exist. Yes, definitely. There's it's help available. There is help day. available. It's true. But is there mostly private help? Like or can you what does the government uh, offer on a psychosocial level? So I'm not entirely uh, sure about uh, that. I know that there are various non-governmental organizations. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. um, and there are private organizations yes. as well. But there are non-governmental organizations and student organizations that are doing a lot of great work mm -hmm. related to sexual health, I mean. 
I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to tap mm. into you ladies, all of you around the table, and I'm going to get those contacts and we're going to put them onto mm. this chat so that if anybody's looking at that, they can find the places that, that at least as you said, start the process, That's whatever okay. you feel comfortable with, start the process and find the information. Now we started off talking about STIs and I started off by saying, I cannot stress the importance of even if you suspect you have an STI, even mm. if you don't even think you, even if it's never occurred to you, the repercussions of not yes. investigating an mm -hmm. STI can be utterly life-changing. And I speak for, uh, mm. about that from experience. So the importance of it is profound. Mm. Now, we've talked about there's just one new GU clinic. There's going to hopefully be more available. Mm -hmm. But if you're somebody who's not sure, doesn't know, what, what, how can somebody get help? How can somebody seek wisdom about their sexual health and better sexual health? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Safer. Safer. <laughs> Damn it! <laughs> <laughs> so close. The wine is so very close. good. The wine is very good. It's good wine. <laughs> it is very good. I tasted it. So so yes, I think to conclude, I'll say obviously you've mentioned in the introduction how important it is health for 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 um, the she world and how you've sp you sp you've spoken about health in general throughout the last month. And I say obviously we focus very much about health, physical health, mental health, very important, emotion and social health. But we cannot have good global holistic health without good sexual health. So very important, obviously, to make it a priority. There is still, it's still a very neglected, it pains my heart, but mm -hmm. it's a very neglected area. So we focus on the other aspects of health, but sexual health is often neglected mm -hmm. and not a priority. Now, if you want to make your sexual health a priority, get in touch with us. Um, the Geo Clinic of Mother Day, Gozo Hospital, as I've mentioned, other private clinics across the island. If you feel more comfortable speaking to a GP, for example, to your family doctor, some yes. people might feel more comfortable speaking to us because they have never met us, we don't know them. Mm -hmm. Okay, others feel more comfortable speaking to their GP who knows them sure. since they were young, mm -hmm. whatever, whatever uh, kind of you fancy. Then if they are referred to us, I can say that the whole process is fully anonymous so all the testing is not done under any ID number obviously we don't we all know how Malta is small everyone knows each other and they might worry that their test of chlamydia positive result is going to appear on their under their ID number and everyone is going to know now that they have um, chlamydia or gonorrhea um, but everything is anonymous. We are, uh, we call people in the clinic with a ticket code, um, and all the test results will reach the lab under an anonymous code. So it's a very simple process, not painful as I've mentioned before. The results normally turnaround time is quite fast, depending on where you're getting tested. But the minimum is three days. Sometimes um, the the longest is seven days, and most of these infections oh, are are curable with, with antibiotics before, as you've mentioned, unless you leave them there for a long time and then they cause, unfortunately, like long-term complications. So get tested, break the taboo, break the stigma and normalize testing. Mm -hmm. I love that. Oh, good. I love that. Ladies, I want to say a massive thank you. Congratulations. Well done. The we will do really this good. again. <laughs> but cheers, cheers to cheers. talking. Thanks for having us, Judy. Thank talking you very much. About better <laughs> and safer sexual health. Yes. 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 There you yes. go. <laughs> cheers. Fantastic. Cheers. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks for having